uh, that we're having this conversation with uh, having this conversation uh, with all of you. And I really do want it to be uh, more of a conversation really than a lecture, because I think there's so much which is shifting. Um, and there's, there's only but so much um, that one can kind of analyze, you know, uh, uh, interrogate. Uh, and I think in this period, uh, we need to be both uh, seriously engaging in some deep analysis of uh, the world around us and how it's changing and changing rapidly uh, with uh, the aim and, and <clears throat> intent of developing a, a practical political program that we can put in action uh, to have maximum impact uh, on the future in the way that we desire. So uh, I'll just start getting into it. Um, you know, where these uh, two pieces really uh, come from, some of which I think is obvious, some of which may not be. Um, one of the questions I get, I've been getting uh, quite frequently uh, about the shifting focus article is kind of like, what was the source and what was the stimulation? Uh, and two things really. Um, one was the response, uh, the general response, uh, that we received, we in this case being uh, the People Strike, which is a coalition that uh, Cooperation Jackson kind of initially took a lead in forming uh, in March uh, of 2020 uh, in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we thought that it was a major uh, opportunity in many respects uh, for the left to be able to articulate at the very least uh, a coherent set of arguments around the need uh, for universal health care uh, and, and a broad kind of social safety net um, that would have to be kind of uh, front and center to any kind of public debate or, or social debate within the United States uh, in particular, but also on a global scale. And we thought uh, those of us who were kind of key in formulating that the, the overwhelming nature of the crisis, the scale of it, that it demonstrated some fundamental things uh, that we wanted uh, everybody to note and to, to uh, bring to light. Some things that were not necessarily obvious, at, at least at first. And the first one I started, why we, you know, something that was going on even before we had uh, took the initiative to start the people strike, one of the things was uh, the way in which in early March, uh, the governments of the world, you know, the nation states of the world, uh, totally defeated one of their own uh, kind of conservative arguments. And uh, they brought basically the global economy to a halt uh, and demonstrated that if and when there is uh, the political will, that they can make massive and urgent uh, change. And contrast this to what we've been told time and time again by these very same nation states uh, and the capital forces, um, you know, that basically undergird them, that the world economy is too big, it's too complex, it's too dynamic to alter or to shift or to slow down, particularly in, in light of climate change. Like we've heard this argument time and time again, particularly since 1992, when there have been kind of clear demands put forth that there needs to be a radical shift uh, in global production, global trade, global manufacturing, the use of labor on a global scale. And that we've always been greeted by all of these, these uh, uh, countries that, you know, it's too complex. It's, there's no way that we can stop. There's no way we can shift. We saw that they could, like very easily, uh, when there was a need and when there was political will. And we thought that that was a major kind of opportunity which should not be kind of overlooked. Uh, in light of the, the need to deal with the public health crisis that was right in front of us, uh, but also to deal with some of the deeper structural issues, particularly around climate change. So that was kind of one uh, particular thing. And the other thing was, you know, at that time, we, gearing up for, at least here in the United States, as folks were gearing up for uh, the 2020 presidential run, uh, you got to remember early on at this period when this was was kind of being formed, uh, Bernie Sanders was still very much in the race and still very much uh, appearing to be kind of the initial front runner before 
uh, the Congressional Black Caucus kind of gave, uh, uh, put the death nail to his campaign uh, at the end of March, beginning of, uh, of April. Uh, but the key point was there was, uh, many of us assumed and many of us were being told there was a very active campaign uh, about universal basic health care uh, in the country. And that this should have been a prior moment for there to be some concerted action to move in that direction. And if anything, you know, the pandemic should have shown the need uh, for this to be instituted on a broad scale uh, and immediately within the United States. Now you, you match this up with uh, the strike wave, right? The kind of spontaneous strike wave, uh, a number of wildcat strikes that were just kind of popping off before the pandemic really kind of got noticed in 2019, but there was a major scale up of those uh, in, in uh, March, April, all the way, I would say through June of uh, 2020 with some of that activity still going on, I think to this day, if you look at some of the organizing campaigns around Amazon, some of the stuff around Starbucks, et cetera, now, which is beginning to have, you know, some success in small pockets here or there. Uh, but, you know, this was a major uh, piece which demonstrated uh, that there was uh, uh, some real fight back initiative and consciousness uh, amongst critical sectors of the working class. Uh, and then there was a major explosion all at the same time of mutual aid work that was happening uh, throughout the United States in particular. And I'll just speak to that because that's what I, I know best. I know some elements of this were cropping up uh, everywhere, uh, all over the globe in response to the pandemic, some with mixed success, but definitely here in the United States. And why I think this was so central, at least to me, why I thought this was important, because it demonstrated uh, that the bonds of social solidarity hadn't been completely broken by the neoliberal project, right? And there was kind of clear evidence that the need uh, for folks to, to be connected, to stay connected, the willingness to, to uh, share and to care for uh, fellow human beings was concretely there. And uh, when the need arose and space was created for it to happen, uh, that people responded uh, in the tens of millions, not just the small you know, thousands here or there in each particular city, any individual city, but in the millions, right? And we saw some uh, massive um, uh, here in the South and in the Midwest, you know, uh, farmers setting up direct uh, uh, engagement with communities of taking food directly there, bypassing, you know, the, uh, the middleman of the distributors and the super in the supermarkets, et cetera, and going directly to communities to meet their needs. And also they're making sure that the crops didn't kind of remain fallow with production, kind of slowed down, kind of ground to a halt. And then the, uh, in the midst of um, the shortages that began to be uh, kind of felt uh, and seen in many respects by April and May. Now, I, I tell all of this, you know, as just some background to uh, shifting focus, because one of the things that it became apparent by the end of the year, right, even in the midst of the massive and historic uh, Floyd rebellion, that there was still, uh, in the midst of this profound uh, kind of spontaneous motion towards, you know, creating new systems, altering things, major demands uh, for radical change, that things were being very systematically boxed into the very same, narrow channels uh, that the Democratic Party in particular can, can so easily manipulate to move things into an electoral arena. And as we were witnessing that, we were trying to uh, understand in the context of particular shifting focus uh, why it was so hard for most of the progressive forces, most of the social democratic forces, and most of the liberal forces kind of in and around the Democratic Party uh, uh, arguing for, you know, Biden at this point to be president, uh, why they couldn't articulate a real a program uh, the to kind of really move the society in a, in a much more transformative way and why so much was contingent on just not, you know, anybody with Trump kind of an argument and articulation. And we were trying to, to really highlight 
uh, in our work, in our argumentation, that Trump was a, was, is just merely a symptom of a deeper structural problem, right? Now, he, he may be a very um, uh, effective and distasteful symptom, but still in all, just a system. And that this, uh, the, the, the political program and the orientation that he represents is a global one, not just a regional one, not just a, a, a US state one, but it's actually a global phenomenon. And you see it play out primarily if you, I'll just concentrate on, on Western countries, but not just there alone, so-called Western countries. If you look at Boris, you know, uh, uh, over in the UK, uh, if you look at the rise of uh, various right-wing forces uh, in France, in Germany, uh, if you look at the, 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 the ability of the right to kind of capture governments uh, in Austria, uh, in Italy, um, if you look at you know, where uh, the governments of, of uh, Poland uh, are at, or the model really set by uh, Viktor Orban uh, in Hungary, which I think is one of the, 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 the key uh, kind of roadmaps, if you would, for a lot of the things that uh, Trump and then Bolsonaro in uh, Brazil uh, use, that there's a deep structural piece that, that underscores this around where the capitalist and imperialist system is at and how it's struggling at this particular point in time uh, to reproduce itself in, in and with the margins uh, uh, that it desires, right? And how the system is breaking down uh, as in particular China develops into a global power and there's more of a, a multipolar world within the capitalist orbit uh, than the previous kind of arrangements that uh, have been set up particularly after uh, 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 the demise of, of the Soviet Union in that particular uh, uh, experiment. And the critical thing that uh, we really agreed upon and we wanted to bring home uh, is kind of dispelling this, this notion, if you will, that there can be and there is somehow a democratic capitalism uh, that we should be arguing and, and fighting to preserve as the left in our context because it's some guarantor of civil rights or human rights or certain kind of social contracts and protections. And we wanted to put in context that the system, the capital system, the imperialist system, it is, you know, it's flexible, it adjusts, and it does so, it's done so historically and it does so currently. And to dispel this myth I think really prevalent in the United States that, you know, uh, bourgeois democracy, uh, particularly in its kind of uh, uh, Republican form as expressed in the United States, like this thing, this is the ultimate way in which capitalism expresses itself. And these two kind of go hand in hand and like capitalism leads ultimately to democracy. We wanted to put out a, a, a clear analysis uh, you know, based both in history and based in current events to really dispel people of that notion. And to get folks to understand the system will create the forms of government it needs to preserve its own interests. And when and where, uh, you know, the carrot doesn't work, it will resort to the stick. And then that is kind of the era that we are seeing on a global level. We really wanted to bring that home so that we can start arguing and building a, a program to the greatest extent possible, which is not based upon just preserving a, a certain minimum set of rights, but challenges the system at its core uh, to the greatest extent possible by recognizing what it is, how it functions, and what it's trying to do in this particular era uh, uh, to extend itself, to extend its life in the face of some of the profound threats to it, to its own you know, realization and continuance, particularly given uh, 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 the threat of climate change as a, as a, as a hard barrier uh, uh, to its extension and its growth, uh, that we need to look at that very much like just smack dab right in the face and to take it on uh, for what it is and to try to build a, a, a global program, not just a local one or not just a national one, 
for the global program that addresses the system for Edis material foundations and tries to extend a, a broad program of uh, democracy in shape with the economic transformations that are going to be needed and the ecological transformations that are going to be needed to create a society that can actually enable humanity, I would argue, to survive, right? Given, given the, the, the trajectory that we are on, uh, which, you know, the next 100 to 150 years by anybody's measure at this particular point in time is going to be rough for humanity, right? The ecological collapse that we are witnessing in real time if we don't make some major fundamental changes in the here and now, uh, our children and grandchildren are going to be in some serious shit, y'all. So uh, that was the, 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 amongst many of the focus, that was kind of the core things that we wanted to really uh, bring home. And this was in light of, uh, I think the profound, radical consciousness that we saw exhibited on a global scale in light of the Floyd Rebellion, which started last June, and which raised some profound demands that if you know pushed to kind of their logical conclusion would lead to dramatic you know types of a system change. So one of them in particular, which many people kind of uh, uh, denied for for being kind of too over the top, but I think spoke directly uh, uh, as clear as anything else uh, to the deep structural need that, that's needed and, and how that resonated with so many people uh, in the community, far more in the, in, in the country, far more than people initially articulated. Uh, and that was this, this abolitionist notion of you know, kind of abolishing the police. Uh, and I know uh, many people were somewhat shocked, but I think it was an idea which really brought into question the, the, the deep nature of how this, this capitalist and bourgeois state has been constructed and why it's been constructed and how it operates that totally demonstrates that the fallacy that this, this project called the United States has been or is a democratic one, right? That demand really highlights the, the, the focus that uh, both within the structure of, of the 13th Amendment, uh, how in, it, it uh, eliminated slavery but but left a back door for its uh perpetuation right there within the law right there within the framework uh, of, of the so-called constitution uh and it really highlighted like you know the, the the deep undemocratic aspects of this society and left something that i think the movement could build on but only if it was going to articulate and start advancing for broad uh, transformation of of a deep social order that I think we kind of lost an opportunity on uh, uh, within the context, at least we thought, those of us who were writing that paper, uh, we lost in the context of, of how we failed to really get across, I think to broad sectors of, uh, of the left, uh, uh, kind of a clear message of the opportunity that exists within that time period, both in the context of the, the pandemic and then in the context uh, of the Floyd Rebellion and how uh, things got so much so narrow, narrowed down and focused in such a way that could be easily contained. Now, one of the things that that we wanted to really uh, highlight and then I tried to confront a little bit more directly uh, with the second piece, you know, which is some thoughts on what to do about the the, the clear and emerging threat of a neo-Confederate, neo-fascist uh, takeover of the U.S. government in the next couple of years, uh, which sadly I don't see there, there being much to stop that train from, from happening at this particular point in time. And, and that is, how do you move on all these different things in a period where the organized forces of the left internationally and globally are so weak? Right, and, and to try to, to, to draw upon the, the vast array of experience in, in the context of this weakness and look at, well, where are the strengths that we've, been, we've witnessed, say, the last 10 years, right? And how do we build on those strengths to then build you know, a new force or a new way and a new mode of organizing and challenging 
uh, both the state and, and capital uh, uh, at their core. Um, and that's where in the second piece and in, and in the part two of shifting uh, focus, which we're still working on, uh, is, is really saying like, look, we've done some profound, this is the we in a broad collective social sense. We've done some pro very profound things over the last decade. Some of which should not be discounted at all, <clears throat> but summed up, um, I think, you know, for both their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and, and on the back of those, try to build some movements that have some connective glue. And it's, it's in that effort to build that connective glue where I think the organizer really needs to, to come in of a conscious and deliberative and intentional uh, uh, orientation and perspective. So what do I mean? Like some of the things over the last 10 years, if we look at it, you know, if we just take the example of the indignados uh, uh, in Europe, uh, which get, gave birth to the Occupy movement here in the United States, uh, how deep and profound it was, how it brought up that movement on a global scale, uh, really brought questions of inequality and class kind of back at the center of discussion on a global scale, where at least here, I know I could speak to the United States totally kind of uh, uh, eviscerated. And it was one of the things that made any real conversation about uh, 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 socialism as an option uh, of where society could lead made real tangible and viable. And we should not discount that, at least, at least those of us living in the United States, where you know, throughout most of our lives, you know, I think we would all agree, uh, socialism was a, was a bad word. And you definitely, most people definitely did not want to be associated with that in any form or fashion, particularly anybody engaged in kind of any public politics. But we saw in the span of a decade that that changed and changed profoundly. Now, what many people mean by uh, uh, the articulation of socialism is, is still very much up for grabs. And I also think that that's a good, good thing uh, uh, as well, both in terms of folks studying, applying, but also trying to not repeat many of the, the uh, shortcomings of the previous experiences uh, that we witness on a global scale of trying to, to usher in that transformation, not to discount them, to take them as, as uh, uh, not negatives, but, but things that we have to learn, you know, both in the positive and the negative of, of how we need to transform things to make sure that the subject of, of people owning, controlling their own labor is at the, the, the basic uh, root of that is one of the critical things I think we learned from the 20th century to apply. But I think that if we look at some of the other movement, the movement for Black Lives, you know, which also has an international character, which emerged during this period. Uh, uh, if we look at some of the more uh, regional expressions of transformation uh, in the midst of some, some profound horrors, if we look at what's going on uh, um, in Rojava, uh, as an example, uh, despite all of its comp complexity and contradictions, uh, uh, and there are plenty there, you know, folks trying to create uh, a new comprehensive and inclusive uh, social order, not just premised upon ethnicity, you know, uh, as, as, as part of what the Kurdish movement, uh, the independence movement of which this movement kind of grew out of, was initially kind of articulating, but transformed this kind of view uh, and, and then put issues of uh, the ecology uh, and also, you know, direct challenges to, to patriarchy at the very center uh, of their political project and their experiment. Uh, and then this, you still have all of the different uh, uh, movements, particularly in Latin America, for which to, to kind of draw from and build upon, and also those in Asia, many, you know, too many to, to really count here. But we've seen some profound mass struggle uh, over this period of time. And then I think the kind of the, the crescendo of that period would be the, the uh, what I call the George Floyd Rebellion in 2020. Um, so, you know, what they all exhibit is that the desire for change is clearly there amongst millions of people, if not billions of people on a global scale. Our ability to sustain the activity, to turn these into kind of revolutionary programs is the most critical thing which is lacking. And I think it is our challenge of trying to figure out how to move this from, uh, I'll call it the, the, 
the age uh, moved from the age of neoliberal socialization, which you know did its best to to break again the bonds of solidarity and make us all just atomize individual uh, units. You know, uh, being prepared to to tap into the metaverse. Apparently, uh, how to break that up and to transform uh, um, that into a genuine age of autonomy, right? And and uh, uh, to try to build upon the types of politics and the stances that we've seen emerge from many of these uh, social movements over this past decade. Uh, and I think where their, their strengths really uh, uh, lie, which is not just uh, challenging the broad systemic dynamics, but also underscoring the need within the movements going forward uh, to address what many people might call kind of like personal liberties and things of that nature, but the broad democratic nature of bringing folks together uh you know so that they can each you know preserve their their both their autonomy but connect very intentionally and deliberately and through democratic practices into a broader social project that is a piece that i think that uh we need to really fully articulate and build upon i think going forward with the concrete program which is not going to settle uh for the basic reforms uh, kind of put on the plate. And, and the clearest thing that I think we need to be, you know, mindful of is that the best that the liberals are willing to offer rhetorically right now is not going to meet uh, uh, the need of the aid or the challenge of the aid at all. The best thing, if you look at, uh, um, you know, if you will want to describe it, you know, Biden in his kind of best rhetorical days has been trying to argue for, you know, some new standard of Keynesian economics uh, uh, along the lines of kind of a broad multiracial coalition and, and playing kind of a politics of making sure, uh, you know, that there are, are inclusion, like little fixes and little articulations to include, you know, each of the core members and give them something to satisfy their articulation without, other, without changing the system fundamentally at all, right? Basically trying to preserve it. Uh, and we really need to, I think, articulate a politics which smacks straight against that and gets at the deeper material needs. Uh, uh, and, and I think it's urgent that we do that because in truth, uh, I can say at least here in the United States, again, you know, the, the place I know best, the situation I know best, um, right now, I would have to argue, you know, that the, uh, the weakness of the liberals on, in this regard has left themselves, left them and their political project totally vulnerable to a right-wing economic populism, which is growing, like profoundly growing. Uh, so much so that that at least you know down here where I'm at, um, the 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 right, the neo confederates have become, you know, the the voice which is clearly most clearly articulating a, a program uh, for the working class more so than the Democrats. Like, uh, and you know, and most of the Democratic coalition historically has been premised on a connection with the trade unions. And that is being totally eviscerated, I think, not only here, but in many places, you know, throughout uh, the country because of the particular orientation, uh, which has been more focused on identity than, than dealing with the actual class based nature uh, of the material foundation of society and how that's been you know, structured and mediated by the divisions created uh, around race, class, gender, eth ethnicity, et cetera, sexuality, et cetera. Um, we, I think, have the tools in our movement, um, you know, with, with intersectionality and, and, and things of that uh, uh, nature, both politically and ideologically, ideologically, to challenge that, to break that. Uh, but it has to be, you know, very much, uh, I think, wedded to a real program that's going to address the material needs of our community that they're being continually devastated. Um, so this is what these two pieces were about. And, and, and just to give some uh, background. Uh, and uh, the one thing that the, the newest piece I'll say, and then I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Uh, many people have been kind of asking like, okay, we, you know, we have an analysis, but then what do we do, right? What's the uh, uh, kind of the, what's the next step? Uh, I'm going to reiterate that I think that uh, an audience like this, we need to figure out how to build 
organizational capacity to be the glue that links these different movements together, right? And the different articulations of things together in a broad democratic way, utilizing all the democratic tools uh, 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 at, at our, you know, at our disposal. And I think some of our central task is to look at the things that have been emerging somewhat spontaneously and link them. Uh, we've been in cooperation, Jackson, been trying to articulate this, you know, over some years now, it's kind of a build and fight formula. And what we've been arguing for is that if you look at the organic practices that, that millions of people actually are engaged in, that we have a foundation to build a very profound movement that is, is also it's addressing the, the fundamental social question uh, around rights and, and democracy and the, and, and the expression of that, but also the material side of the question uh, um, that we need to deal with around who owns and controls the means of production, which is still the fundamental issue uh, 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 that I think we have to articulate a program around that we need to make that this, 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 this combination. Some of the things that we've been trying to point out uh, over the course of time is that if we look at the, the some basic activities that kind of combine these two, uh, we start with this notion around mutual aid, right, and and solidarity uh, to try to start meeting the basic fundamental material needs of all the different constituent elements within our communities. And we don't mean this mutual aid in a, in a sense of a crisis. We mean it, you know, like an immediate crisis that people can identify, like the pandemic. Like, no, there's a deeper structural, you know, crisis that, exi that exists within our communities. You can see it around, you know, homelessness. You can see it around unemployment. It's there, it's a permanent feature uh, of the period and we need to kind of approach mutual aid in that particular way. But we also need to address its weakness. Uh, and that is where the next component comes in. Uh, it, it, those are the productive components so that the mutual aid is not just dependent upon kind of extracting resources from this or that grocery store to kind of de de deliver charity, but actually be directly connected to our own productive capacity and our own productive initiative. So that being very much tied to food sovereignty and food uh, uh, security efforts, you know, however great they're articulated in your particular uh, uh, region, directly connecting those to the, to the mutual aid work and then directly connecting that to what we would either call the, the cooperative work, but I would call it more appropriately, you know, the, the self-organized activities, you know, uh, uh, of people in the economic arena that can be co-ops, but that still also articulate all the different types of organizing that are necessary that at all the different points of production, distribution, and exchange that we need to be directed at to make sure that we are uh, uh, taking care of those immediate needs and then democratizing them to the greatest extent possible. And so for me, let me be clear about what that, what that means. So that, that's extenuating to union efforts to not only have rights at the shop, but to try to democratize the shop by you know, uh, uh, putting it under workers' direct control so that the this kind of strike wave movement that we see not only has an articulation around you know, greater pay or, or a greater access to healthcare, some of those fundamental things, but us infusing and trying to direct that consciousness, like, why don't you take over the shop and why don't you manage it? Why don't, for instance, why don't we democratize uh, 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 Amazon, not just strike, you know, a work toward the union, but actually take over the, the joint so that we can, you know, uh, move society in a profoundly different way to meet its basic needs with the tools that have been brought up through the massive exploitation of our labor, you know, within that system and then redirected in some fundamental ways. Um, and then the, the piece that we think of those first order that really needs to connect all these different things uh, are like people's assemblies or, or uh, um, community forums, whatever you want to call it, but, you know, in your particular area, but things that engage people to scale in your communities where people engage in direct and deliberative decision making processes, the deeper function of democracy, not in this representational form, but it's in direct form. Like these are things that I think we learned in particular from uh, both aspects of the Floyd Rebellion that we saw, I think, it best exhibited in Seattle and Portland, you know, for a stretch of time, uh, but then also some of the best examples of Occupy. Uh, but the trickiest, and this is something we've been trying to do in, in Jackson, is to make these sustainable features of how our communities function and, and, and meet their basic needs uh, uh, to both push the state and challenge it where it is, is, is needed, but to also do the things in our own communities 
where we can practice self-production and self-governance at the same time. So those are some critical things that we think in this period, short of the old kind of parties that, you know, many of us used to know, and which played a very definite role in organizing and building social movements, but to take the actual material that exists now and build upon it and make these connections that need to be made because there's millions of people involved in these, in these activities, but unfortunately, many of, of, of many of them are not connected in an organic fashion. I think that is one of the critical tasks that we're going to have to take on during this next period uh, um, to really meet the challenge of what's coming down. Uh, and I will just, you know, I will say this, that uh, I am in no form or fashion trying to be alarmist uh, in saying that uh, the United States uh, is very, very close uh, to, to having one party rule by the, by the end of uh, 2024, beginning of 2025. Um, you know, I think for sure the, the Senate is already basically by all practical extents, it's already really much even now really in the control of the Republicans. Um, you know, uh, not necessarily in name, but in all practical fact with uh, the nature of how cinema and, and uh, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name in, in uh, West, West Virginia uh, right now. Uh, mansion, man, you know, are the way that they're playing the game. And I think, you know, come um, come November, I think the Republicans are going to win it outright. I think they're, they've played their hand profoundly well. I think that's also going to be the case uh, basically in, in, uh, in, in, in the House uh, by all indications, by all uh, um, the things that you see kind of developing and moving. You know, uh, they have the Supreme Court locked up and we need to face the reality um, particularly if, if uh, the Justice Department doesn't make some real quick and immediate moves on, on Trump, that Trump could easily, uh, very easily, I think, win or make a good run at winning in, in 2024, given the performance of Biden, which will make that much easier. Uh, but if it's not him, you know, because they find some way to remove him from the game, from the case in Georgia or what's going on now uh, uh, around his own personal finances, et cetera, in New York. Um, I think they've developed enough characters, if you would, to uh, replace him. If you look at the governor of uh, Texas and the governor of Florida, um, you know, those are probably the, the two leading candidates, but they got some other folks in the wing. Um, and it just, you know, the, the program, the political program and the style of, uh, uh, kind of the, the, the method of, mu of moving that program that Trump, uh, you know, kind of set a trailblaze for, that's going to continue, whether he's there or not. That, that is the nature of how this is going to move uh, going forward. And the thing that we have to contend is don't sleep on this notion that uh, you remove the personality and that base is going to just somehow disappear. It's not. Uh, that base has been constructed over a long period of time. Too many people on the left uh, ignored warning signs or didn't take it seriously for far too long uh, as they were building up steam. Uh, and, you know, and, and people, I think, f uh, forget or want to, to overlook the deep pockets that that movement has uh, and what, you know, that it, it can draw upon resources that our side of the equation cannot draw from. Uh, and will not draw from. Uh, so we got to take this seriously, not just here in the United States, but on a global scale. And I think there are some profound ways in which we have to get ourselves organized along a program similar to what I articulated on, on a local scale to, and get ourselves ready uh, to deal with this in the long haul. Um, and in the short term, I don't think there's any way uh, around that. I can tell you here uh, in Mississippi, uh, we've been warning folks about uh, this kind of development for a good number of years. Uh, and one of our jokes, in fact, when Trump was elected was, you know, now everyone knows what it's like to live in Mississippi. Uh, 
Um, sadly, I think that's becoming more true uh, by the day. Uh, but we are here, hopefully, providing some illustration of uh, that you can organize under these terms and conditions. Um, you can do so relatively successfully. Uh, and that, you know, uh, this is as much a moment of opportunity for us as it is for their side of the equation. That is the piece that I think so much of the, the kind of uh, let's just, you know, concentrate on the elections and order them out. Like it misses the boat of the real opportunity, which is in front of us. And that is that the system is at, in a, at a deep inflection point. Uh, and, and, you know, as we move, build our strength and capacity, we're going to be able to exert our own program into the field of play uh, and have it be a real contester for what the future will look like. We cannot miss this moment and we cannot just kind of sit back and feel totally threatened as much as opportunity is available for us as it is for anyone else. And that is that is the deeper part of what the shifting focus is trying to get at. I think the second piece will try to spread it out a little bit more, um, but the, the thing to really try to bring home, this is as much an opportunity for us as it is for the right. They are just better financed and at the present better organized. But you know we've seen our side can make some profound leaps uh, uh, when the situation and the need arises, the need is here. Let's rise to the occasion is our message. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Kelly. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, really insightful. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions for you now. So we've got plenty of time uh, for discussion, for questions, all that sort of thing. There's two ways that you can... Um, ask a question. First, you can raise your hand virtually. Now to do that, click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, then click on the raise hand icon. Uh, after you do that, I'll call your name uh, and I'll unmute, uh, unmute you. Alternatively, if you don't want to ask a question yourself, you can type your question into the chat and I'll read it out for you. Uh, if you're gonna ask a question, I'd also ask you to turn your video on as well. Uh, so I have, uh, also I should say that um, I'm going to ask questions in, uh, I'll take groups of three questions and then uh, hand it back to Kelly to answer them, just so we can get as many people in as possible. So, Rebecca. Hi everyone, hi Pete. Hi Kelly, good to see you, be with you all. Um, so yeah, this question of program. What, what we saw here in Madison, and I, from 2015 to 2021, I was working on the, in, in the city side on the program of trying to common, use city government to commonize as much um, as we could. And police accountability was, was the big part of it. And so what we experienced during the Floyd rebellion was after months and months and months of difficulty getting, um, the, this proposal for the most, uh, the strongest oversight and independent monitor with subpoena powers in our police department, getting that passed, all of a sudden, the, here's a groundswell of people demanding that we got her done in like two months. And so that, that um, those moments you talk about and the issue of program uh, and connecting programs with each other, like having that, having that communication network is so important and have and building on the foundation of where the, the movement is with the people. Um, so a couple months after it gets passed, of course, the machine is coming and, and trying to, you know, trying to uh, undermine it and, and, and does. Um, but it's this iterative process that I feel like if we have programs that are connected with each other and uh, and um, programs that are about actually getting those bases of material mutual aid like land, freeing the land, um, that that's, that's the level we can get some wins. But, you know, I don't know about national politics, but once we, you know, and looking at a resource extraction resistance um, as well, like it's these pockets um, that if we're if we're in communication and network and in mutual aid with each other, that's where I see um, the hope. Do you have comments on that? 
Thanks very much, Rebecca. That's a brilliant question. Um, I've got another person uh, in the stack, David Jameson. Would you like to ask your question next? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, David Jameson, editor of Conta.scot over here in, in Scotland. Uh, Callie, thanks so much for uh, the introduction. Um, I think you touched on many of the things that are plaguing the minds of activists in, in lots of different national contexts of how to move beyond our, our kind of current juncture. And I agree with you very much about the limitations of, of parties like the Democrats or in Britain, parties like the Labour Party or indeed like the SNP who, who govern um, in Scotland. Um, I, I feel like in the last few days uh, with what's going on in Ukraine with Putin and in Britain, um, these kind of centrist parties are really lining up behind uh, NATO and the kind of military industrial complex here. We're really seeing the consequences of not having substantial enough political organisation outside of those um, parties. And we're really kind of paying the price for that in a sense. Um, though, of course, there are still movement initiatives outside of the, of the parliamentary sphere, you know, pursuing an anti-war line. Um, I wanted to sort of just get your take on a really broad general question that despite the differences between Europe and the United States and many other parts of the world where there are very different local and national conditions, I think we still, all of us, even in parts of the world system like Latin America that you know, it's, you know, still have quite strong workers' movements and stuff, all of us are suffering from the lack of a strong, permanent, organically reproducing mass workers' movement. So in Britain, the trade, trade union membership has halved in the last sort of 30, 40 years, but really that masks much deeper problems because it's, it's worse than halved, basically. It's, even the, the membership rules kind of don't tell us how inactive many kind of trade union members have become, how hollowed out trade union organisation has become. But not even just trade unions, I mean, wider working class initiative, working class mass parties, of which there used to be many in, in the European context and so on. And, and class struggle, um, you know, discussed in that way as, as the working class fighting for its own interests and so on, has retreated quite persistently over the last few decades. I was just wondering if you agree that that's kind of what lies behind many of our problems, many of our organizing efforts. It means that, for example, in the kind of movements that you mentioned, like Occupy, we have movements today that often flare up. Um, they are sort of, they last only for a few weeks or a few months. They then kind of crumple back down again and they don't leave behind consistent kind of organization. And that that might be partly a consequence of a lack of kind of mass activity on, on behalf of the working class more generally, a more permanent type of organization. How do we, I know this is a big question, but how do we get back from that situation? How do we um, manufacture a situation that, that helps the kind of regrowth of that kind of organic mass working class uh, movement? Thanks very much, David. Very big question there. Um, so I said I would take things in groups of three, and we've also got, Callie, one question in chat, uh, which I will read out, uh, and it's from Greg, who says, you mentioned people organising neighbourhood assemblies. Do you think that that might be able to morph into something like New England town meetings, which have actual government decision-making power? So a lot of you to respond to. Um, I'll hand it back over to you. Uh, I think I want to try to start with, with uh, David's question first. Um, I think, I think, and this is an argument I've been, been making and will continue to make, um, proof is still in the pudding, but I think that there's some examples of, of what I'm articulating for uh, are playing itself out, right? It's something that needs to be looked at. But I think we have to shift our 
thinking about not only organizing, you know, uh, to will power at, at the points of production. We have to now really also shift our thinking, I think, in order to get where you're, you're, you're aiming for, David, and where I think we all should be aiming for, I know I'm aiming for, uh, the level of power, social power, to bring about the transformation that we want. We need to be looking at organizing not only there, but at the points of distribution and at the points of consumption. This is a way in which I think we can we can tap into uh, many sectors of the class, which kind of come in and out of stable working relations. But to be able to build organization that puts them in a permanent relationship with the other sectors of the movement who have you know uh, some form of employment or in and out of employment or in and out of uh, um, some access to to public goods in the forms of um, uh, you know what was here in the United States you know the subsidies and welfare like that is the piece that we need to do so it's, we've had some history of this you know, go back and look at uh, in the 30s, the unemployment councils, for instance, and how successful they were in the United States, at least for a period, about a four or five year period of shaping some aspects of what became, you know, the, the New Deal as it progressively developed over time. Uh, so there are some examples and some models that I think that we can we can build upon and we have to tap into about how we we have to organize, I think, in this particular period, if we're going to see and realize not only the levels of strength that we had, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and some aspects of the 70s and even the 80s, like if we're going to get back to that in any fundamental way, we're going to definitely have to rearticulate like how we're organizing to meet those three things. And I think, again, is organizing at the point of production, organizing at the point of distribution, you know, because particularly given the nature, I mean, what I mean by that, so folks are clear, <clears throat> you know, logistics is a key aspect uh, of, you know, the modern global capitalist infrastructure. Uh, um, you know, the ports, uh, be the airports, you know, trucking ports, uh, uh, the seaports, like all these, the railroad, don't forget that, like that's a very important infrastructure still here in the United States of the, the, the movement of goods and services and where some strategic intervention can and ultimately will have to be made and I think our side should also try to learn, you know, some critical lessons of, of what can happen and potentially should happen under different conditions from what we just witnessed up in Canada, right? Even though that kind of had a very right wing undertone to it, the tactics and some of those stuff are stuff that came from our side of the equation historically, at least we, we forget and can still be used, I think to some critical impact, uh, um, the, you know, with something that's about a broader issue of, of uh, uh, equity and transformation in society. So, so we shouldn't take kind of a a bad example and jettison everything that that is used within it uh, because it can be reapplied. We got to learn from that, and I think that's a critical piece. When I'm saying at the point of distribution, what I'm talking about to be clear, so everybody has that, and then there's at the point of consumption, right? Like uh, uh, who and how has access to the to the various goods in society, and who is deprived of them because they don't have adequate income or uh, controlled forms of, of of income through various types of uh, monitoring women in particular for the social services that they use. Like those are things uh, or have to tap into that we're gonna have to break. And we do that by organizing folks at that point. So they, they are tied into a concrete network that's utilizing its power to move, you know, a core, core set of demands and programs forward. Um, that is how I think we're gonna do that. And I think the, the piece that I would, the organization of if someone which really wants to look at how some of these different things together uh try to get your hands on uh, uh some of the moves around the shack dwellers movement uh in Azania, also known as uh, south africa i think they've been doing some of the most innovative stuff over this past you know decade they're under some very intense repression from uh the anc particularly on some local levels 
but in despite all of that, I think doing some profound things that are actually touching in on all of these different things, but primarily concentrated around first and foremost, you know, kind of securing housing for those who live uh, in the shanty towns on the outskirts, you know, mainly of, of, of the townships, the old townships that the apartheid regime constructed and how they're going about building their members, utilizing their power and tapping into all these different things is something to really, I think, to, to, to check out you know, and something that all of us can learn from. Um, the, uh, Rebecca's question, the question that came from uh, the, the commentary in the, in the chat, I think are hitting at some of the same things. Um, you know, I'm an advocate for the people's assemblies being used and wielded as instruments of dual power. Uh, uh, and I think that there are a way in which we have to build them up so that they can exercise and have some direct impact on the, the direct institutions of the state, similar to the, to the uh, example uh, that was cited from New England. I think that but that one's a rare exception, at least in the United States. But I think we can look at, you know, plenty of case studies. Uh, the Zapatistas, I think, at, at some of their, their height in the 90s being one of the clear examples of, of how you can actually impact, impact the, the things in your social environment without always necessarily having to go through or be mediated by a repressive, you know, uh, uh, state, uh, and where they did so very effectively to transform at different points in times, not without contests, not without some some reversals, you know, how the state functions and who it serves and, and to what interest. And that is a critical piece that I think we have to keep in mind in this current period of what we're building them for. And it's for that level, I think of you know, we're going to execute what we need, you know, to serve our own interests and build our own capacity as democratic subjects. That is a critical piece that at least I would argue and articulate. Um, and then I think this is maybe much more US specific, I think in part tackling uh, what you're saying, Rebecca, I wanna, I think we have to really, uh, what I'm calling like we need to do a serious, uh, 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 analysis of kind of the geography of, of how this conflict, which, you know, this, this emerging kind of civil war, how and where that's going to play out. Uh, and I think if we, if we look at the maps, you know, where this data, just let's take it as data, if we look at the maps from the last two major elections, uh, we see that uh, the kind of the, the, the concentrated base uh, of the left, I'll call it that in a, in a loose sense, because I don't think this is actually what it describes to, but if we look at the, the where there could be some national affinity for that type of program, it's largely uh, in urban and suburban kind of networks. And so we have to recognize that in terms of sheer numbers, uh, those the, the, we kind of represent, at least in the U.S. context, a greater body and a greater number of people. But uh, how politics is actually played in the United States is very much mediated by land, right? So that uh, uh, Delaware has just as much strength, say, like in the Senate as, as California, right? And it's got nothing to do with population. It's just the old archaic, you know, uh, setup that they borrowed from the, the old Lord kind of ship piece over in, in the UK uh, and transported here to be very explicitly an undemocratic feature upon popular democracy as it, as it was expressed through the, through the Congress. And so I think we, we need to see how that's extended and when, where we need to make some critical inroads. We have to start really thinking about how, how like very consciously and deliberately, I think from this point going forward, like we have to, to make a real did those of us in urban areas to fortify uh, those forces that 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 we can make concrete connections to in rural areas, like that has to be, in my view, a priority of of where and how we're going to build, you know, these new movements and 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 to just think that we're going to just concentrate or have to concentrate all of our efforts, uh, um, you know, just kind of the rural in the urban communities where most of us are now situated, I think is a dead end trap at least within the United States that we're gonna to have to break. And I think we have to be very conscious and deliberate uh, in during this next period, I think like in this next decade 
as many of the suburbs are actually shifting in their demographics. So in the United States, for folks who may not you know, be familiar with our context, uh, the suburbs are becoming a kind of contested spaces where uh, a good number of them, particularly outside of the major kind of cities, the Houston's, the Atlanta's, the Los Angeles, the, you know, New York, et cetera, most of the suburbs, which used to become kind of these exclusive white enclaves for decades, are now either majority black or brown or rapidly becoming as much, right? Uh, now their political strength is still very much often tied, tied to the, the organized capacity and the institutional capacity built by the Republicans over the past couple of decades, but they are real places of contest that we have to just start developing strategies that are very conscious and intention of going in there and, and creating splits within the, the neo-Confederate and, and the neo-fascist kind of coalition that breaks up then dilutes their powers in very particular ways. So, you know, I think there's one kind of uh, urban to rural strategy that we need to create. And then another one which is the concentration during this next period of moving the suburban kind of pieces in, the, in those particular areas in a particular way. And I think the people's assemblies piece is one concrete way of moving that, that, that can be very much tied to the kind of the existing structures of the state and trying to move them in our direction and move people in our direction through a combination of, of, of uh, these type of programmatic activities. Thanks so much, Kelly. Okay, um, I've got Patrick Barrett from the Havens Right Centre who has put up his hand. While he's starting his video, I'll just read out a question for you uh, in the chat, which I think is very interesting from Seth Alexander Umbo. And he says, I'm interested in your suggestion that we move past unionization as a goal in organizing places like Amazon. One draw I think of unionization as a goal of organizing is that it's a very familiar goal for workers, which also makes it more vulnerable to attacks from the right. How do we disseminate an ideological program or get people on the same page without institutions like unions uh, that can uh, interact directly with workers? Can we skip unionization and go straight to something like a workers' cooperative or some other model? Uh, and then he follows up, or how do we get workers on the same page uh, when the stated goal is unfamiliar to them? Uh, so it's a big question there. And now I will bring in Patrick. Thanks, Pete. Um, Kali, your reference to what's gone on down in Ottawa um, speaks to something I've been thinking about quite a bit lately. Um, which is that, you know, you, you mentioned how they borrowed or stole um, tactics that the left traditionally has, has deployed or employed. Um, I mean, historically, a lot of analysts have talked about the importance of disruption and, and the use of numbers as something that the left and the working class has to rely upon, uh, as, especially when it counters um, organized money. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you know, you, we see the display of this sort of thing. And it, I think it's also true that the, the so-called um, January 6th insurgency and the way in which the right has used the defense of that um, by um, comparing it or contrasting it to what uh, took place with the, you know, rebellion over George Floyd. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. I mean, the thing that I've been thinking about is that this complicates things. And I'm just curious how you see this. Uh, in what ways do you think um, the development of these types of tactics on the part of the right complicates their use on the by the left? Um, the way in which you know it makes it much more difficult to and and requires a more sort of nuanced differentiation between what the right and the left are doing and how that makes things more difficult or challenging for us. Thanks very much, Patrick. I don't have another question just now. So Callie, I'm going to ask you one if that's OK. Um, David previously mentioned the crisis in uh, Ukraine um, and uh, uh, the role of NATO in that. And I was just interested in your take on what the situation there says to us about the current state of US imperial power. So I'll just throw that in at the end. <laughs> uh... Of course, you would come with the, the toughest question, Peter. <laughs> um, well, let me start with that one and try to get it out the way, if I, if, if I can. Uh, my take on this is definitely not one of the more popular takes uh, on the situation. But 
Um, uh, now, don't confuse me with Trump on this one, but I do think uh, uh, Putin is a damn good chess player, you know, uh, and 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 that is what he's doing based upon. Uh, his particular read of the declining strength of U.S. imperial power, uh, and this is the second foray uh, in this in in uh, the Ukraine that he's made, and 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 uh, both at this point, uh, I'm gonna say at, at both junctures of the road, uh, he's made some major uh, uh, inroads in redefining power on an international scale. Right, he's he demonstrated you know, uh, during uh, Obama's term that, um, you know, much like in the 19th century, the, the, the big states can, or previously, but well, that was the major period in which this kind of power play uh, was u- utilized in history was, was towards the end of the 19th century, uh, where the, the great states just gobbled up the smaller ones, um, you know, and used them to their strategic, uh, for their own strategic spheres of influence and purpose and, and extraction. Uh, and I think we see this, uh, you know, Putin is kind of the, the Russia in this case, let me stop personalizing, is kind of the tip of the spear uh, in one sense, but you see this also in a slightly different variant of it uh, in what China has been doing uh, for the last uh, year with all the maneuvers uh, uh, and gains that have been making uh, in and around Taiwan, right? Uh, all the exercises and flyovers and challenges, you know, and poking and prodding the the, the U.S. to see to what extent uh, uh, does it have a will or an appetite uh, uh, to kind of use its uh, uh, its hammering to this extent. Thus far, um, there's been no appetite, right, for a direct engagement. Uh, and part of the thing, this link it back to the piece that I was starting off with earlier, you know, because some of this we kind of little we embedded some of this piece around, particularly the rivalry with China, uh, in the shifting focus article, and the the piece there was to just uh, highlight that uh, the sanctions regime that the West could so strategically uh, execute, you know, with with devastating precision throughout most of the 20th century uh, uh, is fundamentally gone, at least when it comes to, you know, some of the major, major players like China. You just can't isolate it, right? Like that, that's too far gone. It has, it has its tentacles too far deep uh, into all of the financial flows and institutions uh, of the world. And it's not by uh, chance, by any stretch of the imagination that China uh, really has been the, the the leader in the argument that uh, there needs to be some new currency or an alternative currency to remove the dollar standard uh, on an international level. Um, this is something that they've been very vocal about for at least a decade, if that more, but I think very much now in a position of, of even stated, I think it was two or three years ago that they were going to make some attempts, attempts at kind of creating a, a new currency backed by several different uh, uh, nations. Uh, and if you look at how they've been kind of playing the game fundamentally uh, 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 with the EU and the Euro uh, uh, and, and trying to offset, you know, many of their currency holdings uh, there to kind of, you know, balance some things out, um, you know, and how they've been reserving and stacking up a number of different things in preparation to deal with, you know, all of the old uh, um, financial constraints and economic constraints, you know, with the most severe being, you know, the sanction regime say as they pose on, on uh, Iran. Um, that, that day of being able to execute that, I think on Russia and the Chinese and whoever else to a certain extent that the, the Chinese are willing to uh, offer and lend some support to, it's, it's basically gone, right? And so that is why I think, you know, it, with some real confidence, uh, you know, Russia is able to kind of make this, the moves that it's making uh, right now, knowing that the pipeline in Germany basically was going to get taken off the table. Who knew that the second uh, he kind of, you know, amped this whole particular thing up. And then I think we have to look at uh, like what is particular in this case, I will individualize, what is 
uh, Putin's aim and objective in making this move. And I would argue, and this is the part I don't think people, you know, people may or, or may not agree with, but but I would argue for it, is that part of what he is really trying to do is shape U.S. politics, probably more so than anything, right? And I think you know this is a play in, in many respects to ensure. Um, much as I, in, in, in my part of my evidence on this is how he played the game with, with Obama to weaken his hand in position and credibility, understanding American historical dynamics around uh, uh, the divide, you know, uh, over the, the American muscle question, as I call it, between the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, and I think in this one, he's, he's clearly indicating I'd rather deal with with a, a Republican regime than a de Democratic regime. And I think he's really making a big play to make sure that Biden doesn't get a second term. Like, I think that's a, a deeper piece is, you know, like, of course, there's all the historic piece and then the resources and all that stuff, you know, in, in Ukraine. I do think uh, um, uh, the NATO piece is a real concern for the Russians, right? That, that exists pre uh, Putin uh, and will exist after Putin's taken off uh, uh, the chessboard, just given the nature of um, uh, how those two you know, forces are contending for power over the European kind of theater. Uh, that's going to be there. And I think that is a real piece and that there is a, you know, a complicated uh, horse trading history around some, some prior agreements that were made during Yeltsin's term uh, uh, about you know uh, NATO not expanding any further to the West uh, that they were the, that were made you know uh, uh, to the Russians at a particular point in time, but you know they they had no intention of fulfilling any of that. So um, and the Russians knew that I think you know clearly unless they were lying to themselves and and uh, great power politics doesn't play upon you know innuendo and rule never has and never will. So uh, I think you know this is about to what degree can they shape and carve out space for them sphere, for their own kind of sphere of influence and impact global events, you know, to their liking and, and to their particular interest. And in this regard, I think this, I would argue that this has much more to do with how they impact the U.S. internally than anything that within the European uh, uh, theater. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, there is a certain kind of, um, you know, as a student of military, of, of um, uh, military, you know, uh, of warfare, let me just put it directly, you know, like there's some, there's some critical things that he's doing, recognizing the, the, the dynamics of the age, um, you know, that so far Putin has played pretty damn well, you know, uh, that we, that has to be uh, uh, recognized. And I think um, the timing of it, I'm not going to go into it now because of the dominate, but the timing of it, I think if folks want to look at it, is very, you know, fortuitous. At least, and look at how it's changed the news cycle in the United States. So, for instance, you know, um, January and February uh, were decent comeback months uh, for the Democratic Party. Uh, with all the reveals that were being uh, put out there almost on a daily basis uh, about what the January uh, 6th investigation committee was coming up with, right? And they were really getting to a point, I think, uh, at the end of, of January, uh, where they were being very effective in their media messaging about the extent to which the Republican Party, not just Trump and his, his aides de camp, but the Republican Party was behind uh, uh, the effort, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to ensure that Trump got four more years, uh, you know, and now that's basically gone from the media cycle, right? Like the last week, you know, uh, and a number of other things, you know, completely gone. Uh, and I think the major players on, in, in the game are very much aware of that. Uh, and the more that, that, that this becomes a focus and is a weak point, uh, for Biden, the more it hurts the Democrats uh, in the midterm elections. So that's that's the critical piece that I think we need to look at and analyze for what it is. 
uh, uh, and how it's uh, playing itself out. Uh, then uh, how this is all playing out in Europe, I think is also going to help Europe move further to the right, which is also Putin's, something Putin wants, right? Uh, very strategically around how does he reshape the theater to benefit himself there. Uh, and that's a much more complicated uh, uh, piece to kind of break down. But I think uh, uh, that's something also folks, I think, need to be in mind about how this is all, all playing itself out. Um, so I'm gonna bridge this with to to uh, since we're talking in part about tactics, bridge this to to your question, uh, uh, Patrick. Right? Um, does does this all make it more difficult for us? Um, no, I don't think in some regards. Um, you know, there, there's been a pretty healthy debate within the left um, over the question of tactics now, I think since Occupy, that's been pretty heightened, right? Uh, best in, encapsulated around this whole debate around, quote unquote, the diversity of tactics, right? Uh, that's been out there. Uh, I don't think that's going away. Um, and I think it, it if anything, um, the Republicans, right, are, are honing in uh, on tactics in such a way which are making uh, any sense of, of both moderation and mediation impossible. And if, if where I do have a concern, which is, but, but it's a longstanding concern for me, just given the history uh, uh, that I come from and the movements that, that uh, uh, myself and my parents have been a part of and, and, and relatives have been a part of, you know, but I come from a section of the left, which is, which is uh, been designated, you know, uh, as a as terrorist, you know, for generations. So that's not anything particularly new. Uh, 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 to us. I mean, I remember uh, when September 11th um, popped off, one of the things that the formation I was with at the time, we were trying to warn everybody was that, you know, like the big difference between what was rolling out uh, after September 11th was that COINTELPRO was the counterintelligence program, which if folks aren't familiar with that, uh, which is a uh, um, was a surveillance program that the FBI first started to use to monitor the left, particularly the communists and the socialist parties, in, you know, in the forties, uh, but very, we got its most public exposure of how it was used against uh, the black liberation movement, in particular the, the black Panther party and sectors of the new left in the sixties and seventies. Um, you know, they wind up having the church hearings in what, 76, 77, um, which supposedly set this, you know, Barry about what the CIA could do and, and what the FBI can do and what could be allowed on domestic soil. They kept doing all that stuff anyway. It, they never stopped doing the surveillance. They never stopped doing the directed, you know, undermining campaigns and the infiltration. They never stopped doing the assassination programs. Um, you know, they may have turned it down and, and they got better at, at uh, um, casting the left uh, as being unreasonable and irrational, I think in the 80s, uh, uh, as the mass movement portion of it kind of waned, um, you know, it just made the tactics look sometimes much more ridiculous in the in the in the broad public view. Um, but that's always been there, is what I would argue, you know. And I think now it's just going to take on a, a, a new, you know, focus. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, you know, what the liberals would do. First and foremost, they're going to, you know, target with the blanket hammer on the on the cover of equal justice, you know, uh, uh, any kind of mass militants of, of either the left or the right while they're in power. Uh, but very, the difference I think now is, uh, you know, roughly, I mean, and I believe uh, most of the polls that are out there, just because I, I I've been monitoring and tracking. Uh, uh, at least here in Mississippi, you know, the, the, uh, a, the promotion of violence as a means to an end uh, uh, by the right here for well over a decade. Uh, 
that the the it's you know the right views is just justifiable political activity and engagement at this point. Like they're open that that they're outward about that, and there's a sizable portion, even if it's only a third, there's a sizable portion of their base which sees this as um, not only legitimate but the only way in which you know the major contradictions that have now fully erupted and become public. That's the only way they're going to be resolved. So we're not we're not engaging in a in a uh, in a debate about symmetry anymore, right? To get to your point, that's gone, right? That is long gone, I think now. We need to be very much aware uh, of that, um, you know, and, and closer to where you guys are. You know, I think the, uh, not, you know, uh, 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 I know me and it, um, some of us were following um, the Rittenhouse case very closely. I was following it, not because I thought Rittenhouse was ever going to go to jail, I didn't. Not you know, not, you know, and a little bit about the law uh, up that way, and and how it was constructed, and how he easily kind of fit into a self-defense narrative. Uh, but what I was most interested in was how that case was going to be popularized and utilized, you know, as propaganda by the right, and they have done a damn good job of that, you know, uh, during his before the trial, during the trial, and uh, now he's a, he is a major celebrity. Uh, uh, and that is going to be his example is going to be uh, highlighted and used as the model going forward, you know, uh, and we need to be clear about that. So, um, yeah, I think I think the left uh, uh, kind of worrying about being uh, stigmatized with the label of violence is kind of gone. Right. Uh, I mean, it's, it'll still be associated with sections of our, our, our movement always has, always will be. Uh, but I think the liberals are gonna be, be really trying to figure out to what extent uh, they're going to deal with the violence you know, from the right during this next period. Far more than they're gonna be worried about it coming from anywhere from the left. Um, now the last piece, um, I don't think that we can or should skip the union organizing drive phase. That's not what I was uh, uh, trying to articulate or hint at, uh, but it's what is the aim and objectives of the unions, right? And, and can we get past, you know, the Gompers oriented framework that has dominated union building in the United States for most of the last century? That part, I think, needs to be challenged, you know, and, and uh, I've been happy to see so many new works which are articulating kind of a, a uh, class struggle based orientation, you know, to union organizing that are coming out. But the thing, the piece that that I challenge still there is uh, while it is building, while the articulation of at least the, the pieces I've seen thus far, many are coming out this year that I'm waiting to get my hands on a couple of books. While those are, are, are focused on building uh, working class power in, in, on the surface, they're still leaving the question of who owns and controls the means of production in the hands of the private appropriators of the means of production and just trying to cut a better deal. You know, and I think that orientation, even at its finest, did not get us where we wanted to go, where we needed to go. Uh, and where we have to go. So that's why I'm pushing for, no, we need to be in this next period during this next phase of growth within the, the union movement. And I do think there will be, and there is another period of growth that we're living through now, like to, to expand its horizons and not settle for the game as it's, it's traditionally been played, not stay within the narrow confines of the National Labor Relations Act or, or to try to depend upon a National Labor Relations Board to protect it or to give it license or to give it sanction, but to actually go back to its roots when, when uh, union activity was illegal uh, uh, and, and came at great sacrifice uh, to be able to open up and broaden the struggle, you know, uh, to, to, to its fullest extent of, of, you know, reshaping the means of production and then with that reshaping society as a goal. Uh, and then the last point I'll say upon that is, um, you know, we do a fair amount of, of uh, in our working co-op, Jackson, trying to form very conscious and deliberate 
uh, um, alliances with the trade unions, specifically to, to push this question, right? Um, and we have a whole strategy called the union co-op model strategy that we've been articulating, you know, with mixed, mixed results, you know, at, at best uh, uh, here in our, our local context. Uh, but what we found in that, and I don't think we are an anomaly in, in this case, is that, you know, most workers coming into uh, the labor market under 40, they're really not that familiar with trade unions. Right, I think that's a dangerous assumption that we make that they are, right? Uh, that doesn't do us any good. And I think we have to recognize on that on this front how outflanked we have been, you know, by the right uh, 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 in this arena. And we have to do a much better job of educating everybody who come, whether they work at a McDonald's, whether they work at Target. You know, whether they work, uh, uh, you know, at some Amazon factory, uh, the education about uh, who you are and what role you play in society, we have to come with that hard, much harder than I think uh, um, we've been coming at that question from an educational perspective in a while and just trying to rely on kind of the art traditions and like public knowledge and the media to get that message across. We, we, we fail very, you know, just profoundly uh, when we just kind of fall back on the, on the tradition that folks know or, you know, are aware uh, when they really are not. And in fact, you know, a lot of the workers, you know, the, the, where we've done probably the most work over the years is, is up at the uh, Nissan factory uh, uh, up in Canton, Mississippi, which is about 20 miles to our north. Um, you know, a lot of folks come into, a lot of young folks, you know, uh, directly out of high school and college who apply there, you know, and, and we try to work with, they come in oftentimes believing that uh, the unions are thugs and trying to rob them of their wages and stuff. Like they come in with that. Like, you know, that's the extent to how far uh, the right, I think, is outflanked us on this question and why I don't think we can either skip over or try to leapfrog you know, people coming together to represent their collective interests. You know, I'm just challenging that in this period, we have to push for much more than just better work, working conditions and better wages. That's not enough. Thank you so much, Callie. That was fantastic. And I'm sure we could go on asking questions and, and talking all day, uh, but we've come to the end of our time. So I've just got one last question for you, actually, because um, as I said at the start, uh, the article that I posted is part of a series, and you talk about what part two uh, might start talking about. Um, and I listened to your uh, interviews on KPFA, and that it sounded like there might even be a third in the series. Right, right. Is, is the second part out? Uh, or, uh, it's not out yet. It's not out there. We're, we're still debating a couple of pieces. Uh, uh, and, and um, you know, the, the piece that we're trying to, I think, where the debate is most acute, is, is there's a section in there uh, that we're trying to summarize uh, the experience of the socialist and communist experiments of the 20th century and, and what are the positive and negatives to draw from that, uh, um, you know, to try to make a younger audience in particular, audience under 40, much more aware about these movements from kind of our own perspective and not one from the right. And there's some profound disagreement amongst us around what the lessons are, which is, which is healthy, which is good. Uh, it's definitely sharpening up our thinking and, and, and got us all kind of questioning some assumptions. Uh, but that's the hold up right now. I do think we're going to get it out before March is over. I was trying to have it out before, you know, uh, uh, March 1st, since I'm, I'm primarily, you know, uh, carrying the burden on, on, on the writing. But, uh, um, you know, the, the, resolving some of these debates will make it much more productive, I think, and, and much more helpful. So be on the lookout. Definitely. And everyone, make sure to check out uh, the blog that I shared earlier, Navigating the Storm. Callie, maybe we'll, have, maybe we'll be able to get you back to uh, discuss part two uh, after it comes out. I would love to. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, I really appreciate everyone for coming. Uh, and as I said, thanks to both the Havens Rights Centre and Contour for, for hosting this. Thanks especially to Callie uh, for joining us and to all of you for coming and joining us. Check out the Havens Right Centre website for future events uh, and you can register for them there. Thanks, everyone.
and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, Callie. I'll see you later. All right, all right. Take care.